Good. All right. Good morning and glad you're here. We got people both here in person as well as uh, zooming in. My name is Rich Delo. I'm the uh, chapter president of the West Michigan ASSP Society. And today's speaker is going to talk about dangerous chemicals hiding in everyday products. The hidden dangers of simple, common, everyday chemicals can seriously harm us in our daily lives. What information do you need to make emergency decisions? What it really comes down to. So I just want to read uh, three bullet points. So if uh, Rich is like you may hear, Rich has been in the emergency planning management field for 29 years. Can you imagine that? I don't. There's probably a couple of us that aren't even that old. We've been around when he was starting this business. In fact, we have two students here that's going to be going on their internship coming up this summer. He served as a firefighter, EMT, hazmat technician for many of those years, and also a county emergency manager, which has been tested leading the uh, mitigation efforts of this every 500 year flood in Iowa back in 2008. He stands poised for the next natural disaster. In the meantime, Rich continues to stay abreast on emergency response systems with knowledge. He remains a frequent contributor to the International Fire Service Training Association at Oklahoma State University. Between emergency responses, Rich designs and presents training programs for industries, fire departments, community emergency response teams, colleges and universities, and majoring in disaster emergency management, covering more than 25 states and for other countries. Statewide, Rich is a frequent speaker at the annual Michigan Fire Service Instructors Association and the annual Mission Safety Conference. Everyone, please welcome Rich Mahan. Thank you very much for having me today. This was kind of a scary deal to accept this invitation from Rich, not because of the group, but I flew home from California last night, yesterday afternoon, from speaking in Santa Rosa, California area last week. It's like, you know, how many things can go wrong flying back? A day before you're supposed to speak. So I'm texting him. We're on the airplane now, you know. Okay, we're changing planes in Chicago. <laughs> All right, I'm in Kalamazoo. You have a presentation. So uh, uh, kind of an interesting thing, but it is true. Gas out there is six bucks a gallon. And uh, certainly an exciting place, but the weather was nice. It had a great time and stuff like that. So this is a, a presentation that started out with a little different title. And I did it for the Michigan Fire Instructor Association last December up at Charter City for firefighters. To say, do you, do you understand something about chemicals and chemical characteristics and common chemicals that pass through your community? And uh, to understand about can you make quick decisions without having to do research? You know, people's lives are at, at risk, making taking time to make decisions could be both good and bad as far as that situation. So uh, it just kind of came together to look at some of those things. So uh, as I say here, kind of how quickly can you solve a problem? How quickly can you provide emergency response decision making processes? What do you know? You know, it's like asking the common question. OK, does natural gas rise or sink? You got to know that right now. How about LP gas, propane, rise or sinks? You know, those are, those are critical questions uh, to make in decision making situations. Uh, again, got a little bit about your chemistry hazmat safety knowledge if you're uh, out there working in the chemical field. Uh, what happens when chemicals get out of their container? I photograph chemical containers all the time as I'm traveling because somewhere down the road there'll be a presentation they'll end up with that kind of thing. Uh, can you make decisions without reference material? You know, if your only reference material is this, that may be okay or may not be okay. It just depends. And now, of course, everybody's carrying smartphones. Oh, we got all kinds of things we can find on a smartphone. How fast can you find it? And I'm still a guy that goes back to books because if I'm at a hazmat asset, I want to lay out books so I can look. I can only look at one page at a time on a smartphone, but I can lay out books on the table and look at different things. So I'm still a book guy in a lot of those situations. So as we kind of go along here, uh, what chemicals are used in your industry or pass through your community? You know, what's out there that's going through? And all the time we're seeing lots and lots of different kind of chemicals. And what ones can you make decisions on about making, you know, it, without looking up a lot of information, just things to look up. When we ask about the chemicals in your community, of course, uh, you are working with tier two information and Michigan is one of those states that requires tier two information. What are we gathering? And then once your industry gathers that information together, you've got to pass it to the state where you uh, 
the LAPC, and also that goes up to the CERC, but then at the local level, you've got to give it to the fire department and provide others. And I worked as a safety manager in, at Foot Hospital in Jackson, which has a different name now, but also gorgeous. And I know in, in Foot Hospital in Jackson, we had lots of community industries that gave us all kinds of books with SDSs in them. And it's like, okay, that's great. But guess what? We didn't build an emergency room with a library in it. So where are all those books? Well, they used to ship them up to my office in another building. So if you had a plant employee who came in to be treated, those books are not in the emergency room. Those SDSs are not in the emergency room. You're starting from scratch again. Uh, being a firefighter for 29 years, and I actually worked in this business for 50, I started working in 1972 in the loss prevention business in Holland, Michigan. If you give them to the fire department, we don't have any places on our apparatus to carry all those SDSs. They're back at the station. We don't take them with us. And so if you thought, well, look, we really take care of the fire department, and we give them all this information. Back at the station, we don't have with us when we arrive at your address. So again, we, we've got to look at some of these different things and how can we talk about that and do better? So that was one of the presentations I talked about at the safety conference a couple of weeks ago. Uh, as we look at it, who gets your information? As I said, you're required to provide to the LAPC, which automatically goes to the CERC at the state level, and you're required to provide it to the fire department in the local community. Is there anybody else? Well, hospitals, because of the chemical affecting the employees, things like that might come in. So we don't have, as I said, libraries on the apparatus, so they're all going to be back to station. I talked a little bit about this already. At, at where I was, they always ended up back in my office. You know, here's all these chemical notebooks. You know, well, I don't have room in my office for them either, but with they, that's where they needed to see where the incident is. Where do you have that? One of the programs I'm working on for next year's, I don't have a host yet, for the safety conference in Michigan is emergency evacuation planning and having a box by the door of your facility that has everything you need in it, because guess what? When the fire alarm goes off, you're not going back in to get anything. So what do you need to have outside in a planning box that you can use in that kind of emergency situation? So I can gather a little checklist of things to look at, uh, stuff like that. Some of the ag facilities are pretty good. There's one I see when I drive up here from coming up from Halligan Way along the highway, and I went over and visited one day. They have a nice emergency tube on their front gate. You drive up, here's all the emergency information in the tube, and it's sealed and stuff like that. So emergency responders don't have to do it. But think about what would you provide the fire department if you couldn't go back into your plant or an emergency to get information. Where are your floor plans? Where are your drains? Where are your power shutoffs? All that kind of stuff. And is it in a box that's, uh, that's sealed for the weather? And again, we talked a little bit briefly about the information you can get from your phone. Wonderful tool. I do a lot of presentation planning and work from my phone to get chemical information. But as I said, the key thing is I can only look at one page of actually multiple phones. That's the stuff so people can help you. Uh, decisions are on chemicals need to be made quickly for emergency responders. Again, I did that 29 years. Need to do it for people in the community. If you're going to start evacuating people, what are you going to tell them? Why are we doing this? When I was the emergency manager in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, we evacuated some 15,000 people because we had a river that flooded at 31 and a half feet, never been over 20 feet in the history of the community. So again, a lot of evacuation. Where do those people go? Uh, when they, again, do you know what they'll do when they get out of the containers? We'll talk about that. What information do you have in the way of uh, signage, that kind of thing, what research should be done? And again, other kinds of places that you can get information. So, uh, maybe we could turn the lights out just a little bit more. Is that possible? Back up? Up? Down. Oh. Yeah. There's a couple of these pictures. This is one from California last week at Santa Rosa. And, uh, there we go. Is that okay for your camera thing? Okay. So here's a McDonald's in Santa Rosa, California. Standard McDonald's. The question I have for you, what does this 704 diamond mean on the door? Is it something they're using in their grease to make the French fries taste better? <clears throat> what, what chemical do they have in there that's causing that? So that was just a picture last week, and it's like, we'll talk about it as we go. Uh, and here's a fence gate in Richmond, California, not far from where our kids live. And uh, again, uh, three, four, three. What does that mean to you or to the emergency spotter who's going to that, uh, going to go through that gate? So, all right. So let's do some quick review here on chemistry, just to kind of make sure we kind of are at the same place with everybody. Uh, the first thing is, how do we get gases out of chemicals? Chemicals being solids, liquids, or gases. How do we get gases? That's the primary concern I'm looking at. So again, in solids, pyrolysis is how we break them down to give off products through heat. 
course, liquids, vapor, pressure, boiling point, flash point, fire point are all terms we use to get vapors out of liquids. And of course, gas is already coming to roughly form. But again, we need to look at how do we make this happen in the world of our emergencies. All right, vapor pressure is a small number and it reflects how fast it becomes a gas. So as you look at the numbers, uh, you know, we can say, well, what's water? That's one that we usually use to compare. I know what water is going to do if I spill it on the table or spill it on the floor. But what if I spill LP gas or chlorine or something like that? How fast? Or uh, specifying military, so sarin, VX nerve agents, you know, chemical nerve agents. And uh, those are kind of like motor oil poured on the floor. They just sit there. So how am I going to make those uh, nerve agents effective to do what we were designed, unfortunately, to do? So boiling point, again, heating up, flash point, lowest temperature liquids give out vapors that can be ignited, very important. And then there's a thing called fire point. Well, under flash point, that's what we do with all of our safety cans. And I worked for 13 years with Consumers Power. We decided what color safety can, what kind of safety can you have based on flash point. However, under flash point, chemicals don't continue burning. It's actually under fire point where they continue burning. So up here, I take away the heat source, the fire goes out. I maintain the heat source, this continues on. So we mix these together, but we always talk about flash point. So I don't know if you knew that or not, but it's something that, you know, in our case at consumers, all of our flammable liquids, less than 100 degree flash point, had to be in red metal containers with the labeling and the product name on it, so like that. Anything above 100 could be in any color container, had to be a safety can, but uh, again, it could be any color in the label. Well, that's changed. We now have three designations in this country. We have NFPA for flammable and combustible at 100 degree flash point. We have flammable and combustible for Department of Transportation at 141. And then we have hazardous waste that has a flash point, this changing point at 139. How could we do that in this country? You know, three different definitions for flammable. The, the difference is, is it stored at a site? For use at a site, is it in transportation or is it hazardous waste? All of them have a definition for flashpoint between flammable and combustible. Kind of an interesting problem. And part of that discussion between DOT and NFPA is we want you to go with us as an international. And NFPA said, you know how many things would be affected if we change that rule from 100 to 141 degrees in the world of industry? All the regulations all of a sudden. We're not going to do it. So we now fight out there. So when I see a tanker truck on the highway, with a red flammable three on the back of the question is, is it a flammable liquid or is it a combustible liquid? Is it make a change at 141? Is it below or is it above? I see some. So again, if you see one that says flammable, that means it's below 141. So if it says combustible, it's above 141 degrees flash points. Things to learn. Vapor density, all right. Whether well, gas, I asked you a question about natural gas, LB gas, which are rises, which are sinks. What's pretty interesting when we compare these to one, some rise, some sink, but guess what? There's only 12 or 13, depending on the chemists you talk to, that actually rise. Everything else settles in the entire world. There's only 12 or 13 chemicals that actually rise. So if you guess a little rich, I think you're talking about things that sink, you're probably pretty close, except natural gas rises and LP gas settles. Yeah, that kind of thing. And when we go to an explosion at a building, a lot of times we right off the bat can tell because if it's natural gas, the walls fall out, all the pictures are facing up. If it's LP gas, the building goes like this and all the pictures are facing down. So there are some signs that when we first get there, it may indicate what was involved. So, so when we talk about rising or sinking, again, this is a chemistry thing. And when you talk to chemistry, they're going to tell you 12 or 13. But here's how we remember the, uh, the gases that rise. And so you might remember some of the uh, high school chemistry little tips that they gave you to uh, think about that. But these are all ones that rise. All right, solubility, miscibility, polar, all things that deal with mixing with water. So is that important to me? Yeah, if, it's, if we're going to spill it in water and I'm going to use a flammable gas detector to detect the presence of the product, if it's mixing, am I going to get a good read? If it sinks, am I going to get a good read? No, because it's the water above it. So again, I need to think about these things. And we always look at this one first, is it soluble, yes or no? And if it's not soluble, then is it, is it float or is it sink as far as that situation? So when we think about some of these other terms around flammability, we already talked about those, but ignition temperatures, you know, how hot does it have to be to ignite stuff? Uh, auto ignition, uh, and again, in my career, I have watched lawnmowers burn up. I've seen uh, uh, motorcycles burn up because they spill gasoline on the exhaust pipe. 
and it automatically ignited because the lawnmower exhaust pipe was hot. I watched consumers power company trucks or investigating burned up because they drove the truck out in the grass and the weeds and the catalytic converter set the wheels, the field on fire underneath the truck and the tractors and other kinds of things like that out of the situation. So knowing about uh, auto ignition is, or, uh, is an important thing to think about as far as that, but how hot has something got to be? And if you, uh, if you go back to investigate grease fires on stoves, again, we take a pan, we put grease in it on an electric stove, we heat it up, right? so there's no flame there, but we put it in a pan on a gas stove, it heats it up just like the electric, except now there's a flame source there and the vapors tumble over the side and ignite it and flash back in the pan. So both times they ignite at the same temperature, just two different ways of getting there. So LAL, lower explosive limit, again, important at UEL, on a flammable gas meter, what should these do, do we measure? Only LEL, percent of LEL. So it only will take you to the lower end. And again, when we look at LEL, UEL with gas meters, what gas does it measure? If I'm measuring natural gas over here, gasoline over here, ethyl methyl death over here, what gas does it know? doesn't know any of them. It only knows the caliber of gas. So when you get a reading, you need to know where the cheat sheet is, the multipliers that will correct for your the gas that you're reading. So a lot of people don't know. I'm teaching some uh, hour, hour and a half classes starting next month for firefighters on the basic use of uh, combustible gas indicators. And most of them have no clue about the uh, correction factor because they're assuming that the gas, it's telling me. It, the meter doesn't know anything. It only knows the caliber of gas. So if you're measuring gasoline, it, that's not the caliber of gas. So I got to correct the meter reading with a multiplier. It's either higher or lower. And uh, when he asked, and I did this in Saudi Arabia. So where's your meter instruction manual? It's back in the office. Well, we need a copy of that page from the manual, laminated, attached to the meter, because we need it out in the field if we're going to be making decisions. So. Again, things like that. What's the expansion ratio? Again, how much does it expand when it comes out of a container? And I just did some work with uh, anhydrous ammonia uh, for the safety conference and some others, and that's over 800 times. So one gallon of liquid would produce over 800 gallons of vapor. That's a lot of gas. So things to look at, pH scales. Again, understanding those uh, as to a zero end is the acids, uh, the 14 is the base end, seven is neutral. And again, we need to look at how we neutralize those, and there's different ways to do that. Some Ansel makes a simple product, you can do small ones. And a lot of times we think in terms of labs, and we say, well, I just spilled some acid all over the counter. That's wonderful. Except in my world, let's spill 6,000 gallons of it on the road. How do we handle it? Well, it's the same thing, it's just a bigger deal. So, so we need to look at that. And there's also a piece of this that goes back to the meter. If you're using a four gas meter, are you using pH paper ahead of it? See if there's any corrosion out there. Because if you're not, you may trash your four gas meter before you ever get to your hazard because there were uh, corrosive gases out there. So again, always using pH paper with your meter to make sure there's nothing ahead of it to destroy the meter sensors. All right, reactivity. Again, just looking at what does it like to be with, what doesn't. And a lot of times our cleaning chemicals, we, we'll talk a little bit about. Our problem oxidizers treat like explosives because they can. Uh, what does sublimation mean? Maybe remember that one from high school. Sublimation. Dry ice is the best example, most common. Changes from a solid to a gas without being a liquid. What's another one? Mothballs. If you put mothballs over your or your parents or grandparents use mothballs, they change from a solid to a gas and never look liquid. There's a couple of things that do that. But dry ice is probably the most common. Inhibitor stabilizer. These are things we add to chemicals or transportation. They either a 20 day window or a 30 day window of protection for that chemical that as it's moved across the country and railroad tank cars and trucks, uh, it stays happy. It's important, be happy as far as that situation because if it loses that, it's going to become unhappy, pressurize, expand, and it may blow up the container. So whenever we put in railroad cars, it's a 20 day or 30 day uh, window of time before it gets to the end of the situation. Yeah, we're monitoring them. What are synonyms? Another name for a same chemical. So I used to work with students, you know, we put on their paper dihydrogen monoxide. We got 100 gallons of dihydrogen monoxide. What do you think is it dangerous or not? Of course, dihydrogen monoxide is just water, <laughs> but it sounds cool. 
that. So, all right. Uh, and again, if you're working on safety, you're familiar with all these PALs, RALs, TLVs, STELs, time weighted average as a part of these ceilings and ideal edge. Which, as an emergency responder, which ones of these are am I most concerned about? Thing. Kind of an interesting deal because as an emergency responder, what do I wear? Self contained breathing apparatus. So I'm protected in a sense against all of them as far as respiratory protection. But if I go to a filtering mask, an APR or PAPR, uh, which ones do I have a good concern about? And that goes back to your testing, wear a filter mask. I, I can wear a filter mask at what point? As long as I don't cross IDLH. And so when I went down to the old Army Chemical School down in, in Alabama, where we were practicing it with sarin and VX nerve agents, we were wearing filtering masks in that uh, SCBA because they kept the room below IDLH conditions, like 75% of the IDLH. Everything was on steel cold plates, so it wasn't vaporizing quickly. But again, once I cross the IDLH, I have to be an SCBA versus that. So in an emergency scene, how can we tell? Can we sample and go, oh crap, I'm wearing the wrong mask. Yeah, now I'm in trouble. Or do we just automatically fall to this? And in industry, we automatically so often say, well, put on a respirator. That kind of thing. Well, can things change? You know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on out there that helps us make a difference. So this is nice. You know, eight hour day, eight hour week, but in emergency situations, that's not going to apply. Again, some of these others may not work. Ceiling is the line we never cross because death is on the other side. IDLH is the one that's most common because that's the one that's respiratory protection. So we need to know some of these things. So in my career, my 50 year career, I have been to that sick building thing. How do we respond to a sick building? You know, people are getting ill. My case was a hospital. People are getting ill. They're going to the emergency room from the office sale area. Where do you start? Is it cleaning chemicals? In our case, it was humidification. The humidifier in the furnace was broken, so it was putting no water in the air during the winter months. And it was like working in the Sahara Desert or Phoenix, Arizona in the, in the winter months. And it turned out that was our problem. And I brought in an industrial hygienist to work with us or a company to work with us like that. Because I knew that at some point in time, we were probably going to end up in court. I didn't want to be the person in court saying, oh, here's our, here's our expert. This is our expert witness. Okay. Helping you get to where your problems we can solve, but I'm not the expert witness. I wanted an industrial hygienist, certified, licensed, whatever, to be able to be, do those kind of things. Have you dealt with people who are allergic to smells? My wife is. I watched her do it at Luther Burbank's house in Santa Rosa, California, last week, Thursday afternoon, you know, out in the garden area. And uh, I said, saw what I needed. I had a four o'clock conference call. So I went back to the car. And about 15, 20 minutes later, she came back to the car, literally in respiratory distress. And uh, I got in the car and rolled the windows up, turned the air on, and all that stuff. And she was out with all those flowers. It was killing, literally killing. That kind of thing. Are any of you aware of people who are late, allergic to latex in your workforce and rec recognize that when they get around latex, anaphylactic shock, folks will swell up, stuff like that. I worked in healthcare and uh, we had patients that had that problem because families would bring in uh, latex products or they had people who brought in flowers to the room. We have work staff that were allergic to latex and again, dealing with different products uh, as well as people bringing smells, deodorant, come in the room, the nurse suddenly is in the ER. Because the patient and the family are wearing deodorants. Allergic to those smells. So, uh, latex, uh, again, a lot of things out there that are latex. And, uh, we had to switch over to latex free products for surgery and in our ER because there were too many people who were latex sensitive that come in. And when they're coming in unconscious, can you ask them, are you latex sensitive? So you start working on them, and pretty soon, guess what? They're getting worse. Well, this is supposed to be treatment to help them. In a sense, they're getting worse because they're latex sensitive. Okay. So some interesting situations out there, and you're responding as the safety person. Hey, we got a problem. And again, just a step or two further on the hazmat. Again, our suits level A through D. Uh, D is our regular work clothes or firefighter with SCBA on. And to go up, of course, we deal with all these different levels, and you have to make some decisions. Uh, and then how these suits fail, permeation, degradation, and penetration. Are all things that you have to look at, but the big one here is permeation. How long is it going to take for that chemical 
to get through that suit at the molecular level. That suit means gloves, suit, boots, all there. How long does it take? And then we have people who say in the industry, well, you know, you just had a little bit on your on your foot there when you stepped in the puddle. Let's just rinse it all off, let it dry, and we'll fold it back up with the way or spending another fifteen hundred dollars on the suit. I can send you pictures that show here's the chemical on the inside of the suit after it was put back in storage. I don't want to say it's sulfuric acid with DuPont, with their hazmat team friends of my beard. Then he sends a picture. When we went and did the, the inspection, we found the chemical now actually inside the suit. And you wash it all off on the outside. The permeation is what moves through at the molecular level. So eventually, it's going to get there. Uh, I also, besides working for myself and teaching and various things, I do work for uh, West Shore Fire, which is an Allendale-based company selling the fire departments in nine counties. And I sold the Pfizer Corporation of all their fire department, all new turnout gear, boots and gloves, and all stuff a year ago for them. They're the only fire department in nine counties I cover that bought rubber boots instead of leather boots. Why would they do that? What does leather do around chemicals? Sorbs, penetrates, things like that. So they are, they're old school, the fire chief and stuff like that is, hey, we're doing hazmat, so rubber boots are what we want because the, we don't want the chemical uh, contamination. Everybody else buys a lot of boots, which are gonna get contaminated and it may come through too. So, you know, obviously they knew what they were doing and that's what I would have recommended to them as we went through it. But the thing is, is understanding permeation and the chemical movement through. Um, I did an emergency exercise for a company in Texas a long time ago where we had a simulated exercise fire in a barn. barn. And we now had firefighters who were in there fighting fire and now they're transported to the hospital with medical issues. And uh, so, hey, what's the next piece of information? Well, they were down, found on their hands and knees on the floor, fully checked out and turned out here, wearing SCBA, so the respiratory system was okay, but their body is full of chemicals. What's going on? Chemical contamination through the protective clothing and gloves into their body. And so we needed information from the chemical department at doctor at that company in Texas to give to our emergency room. You remember how in those packages says, call this number if you have a problem? So we had to set up the call after five o'clock on a weeknight to see if we get an answer from somebody. And we finally did it about an hour later. But the scenario was is that the firefighters are in the hospital in trouble, maybe dying. And we're trying to get chemical information for the ER from this, this doctor. Again, what happened? They went in, they sprayed water around, doc jars, the chemicals down on the floor. They're going to crawl in water, chemical spreading, and it's absorbing through their protective. Lungs were protected, clothing or the skin wasn't. So, so again, we need to understand some of these things. Uh, the emergency response guidebook certainly is a is our first resource in so many cases during emergencies, and that's a good book. It does provide us a lot of information, but it's not the only one out there. But you need to understand what all it does and what we can get out of it, and train and practice with it, things like that. So, all right, let's kind of switch gears just for a bit. Look at containers. So here's a ser series of drums from up at the Michigan State Police Hazmat Training Center we used to practice with. And we got steel drums, you know, we got a stainless steel plastic. Does that tell you anything about chemicals? What kind of things go into a, a steel drum with an open top? What kind of things go into a steel drum that has bung holes in it? What kind of chemicals goes into a stainless steel drum? What can go into a plastic drum? As far as chemicals, solids, liquids, gases, what are their hazards? So again, what do I see? And those are kind of decisions you might make at a plant if you came across an incident and you get called to an incident where it was there. If I go up to trucks, there's three major types of trucks here in this picture. Again, the gasoline, typical gasoline hauling truck, corrosive truck, and then a chemical hauling truck over there. So 406, 407, and 412 are the corrosive. So you can tell by the shape. And again, with placards and stuff like that. This is a 406. That can Again, a gasoline hauling truck, and you probably see these with the little black dots on the back of the truck. Does that mean anything? Well, if you get up, you find out that that means that the baffle in this truck has four holes. Normally, they're only doing top and bottom, but the dots indicate that, oh, by the way, it's also cut out here to allow liquid and gas movement inside the compartment. So if I have to drill a hole to suck products out of this truck, that's going to be helpful to me having the four cutouts versus the two just at the top and the bottom. So again, you know, you can impress your kids when they're riding with you sometimes. Hey, see that truck over there with those black dots? That means that the baffles are cut in four places and it's just two. 
Just like my kids used to travel, and I mean, used to make them uh, look at the emergency response guidebook. Should I slow down or should I speed up? What do you guys say? Now they know how to travel with me. So I got to work on my grandkids. These, you know, ERG stuff. But again, shape of the truck, type of truck, uh, the placards, things like that are important. Here's a 407, which is again the chemical hauling truck. And again, it can either have a jacket on the outside or it can be without a jacket. There you can see the actual ribs. And it's teardrop shape based on the uh, jacket. So that's telling me that's chemicals, probably not petroleum products, but it is going to be a variety of chemicals, the workhorse of the chemical industry. All right, move to the next two. MZ331, the chemical or the gas hauling truck, propane, LP gas, nitrogen variety, things like that. And then over here we have our 338, which is the refrigerant type gas, cryogenic type gases. And those actually leak. So here's an example. This is a CO2 truck I shot off a highway one day, drive by, like, holy smokes. And it's venting. It's supposed to vent. That's a normal thing. It's designed to vent to reduce the pressure inside the truck. And so as emergency responders, we'll get calls from rust areas. We'll get calls from people on the highway. There's a truck ahead of me that's leaking and stuff like that. And it's not designed to call, call poisons. It's designed to haul non poisons. But the leaking process is the thing it does to vent lower its pressure. So we switch over to rarer cars, which is my favorite area. Uh, again, we have a variety of specs, DOT 111, which is our normal type car, or what we call low pressure car, 112s, which is the pressure car, and 105s, which is a high pressure car. And then there's also a version of the 111 that with a little different design, but it's basically low pressure. So again, by looking at the top, I can tell high pressure, low pressure. If there's multiple things, low pressure. If there's just one on top, high pressure. And again, as the derailments occur, these things are slowly getting moved into a different kind of housing to protect them the rail. So uh, here's something that the shippers can do. This was out in, um, in New Mexico, and I've seen them in a couple places in the U.S. There's a refinery out there in western New Mexico. The ships are gasoline and high-pressure tank cars. This used to have LP gas, but now it's hauling gasoline. So it's gasoline is normally hauled in a low-pressure car, not a high-pressure car. But under the rules, you can always put something in a better package. That's okay. Now, to us, as we respond and roll up on it, we see this car, I'm thinking high pressure. Okay. Now, one uh, thing on top, high pressure, probably LP gas, and how you're smelling it, butadiene, things like that. But in fact, it's just gasoline. So I got to be able to use my binoculars to see things that are going on. And then the 1203 placard. Right? But the rule is you can always put something in a better package, even if it fools other people. Rich, I have a question. Yes. Uh, I see that label, that matrix. You know, is that required to be on there? Yes. So what do you do or the carrier is supposed to do when they see all this graffiti? I mean, is that a constant thing where they got to? It's a battle. Yeah, it's, it's a is. battle. And again, it doesn't take graffiti artists very long to, to do their work. It just has to sit for a little while or yard or siding. Yeah, you got to. This is the reporting marks, or I mean, the uh, the car reporting marks here. And this is like a license plate for the car. And the only one car that has that number of letters. X means it's not owned by the railroad stuff. The other is a chemical company name. And then over here are my specifications. So DOT 106. 112, 111, right up here. It's just a letter A, S, T, and J. A means shelf couplers only. S means head shields on the ends. T means thermal spray on protection, head shields, and coupler, shelf couplers. And the J means that it has a jacket over the thermal insulation, head shields, and the, uh, the couplers. And then there's a uh, test tank test pressure here 400 psi, 340, whatever. And then it may be. Uh, some other lot of there that indicates how it's built. Well, so, so if the tank car is owned by the, no, excuse me, <clears throat> the manufacturer or somebody else, that then who's liable in the event of something going bad? And it's everybody. Everybody. So if this was CORX, that would mean Coors Brewery. And they're shipping beer concentrate from Golden, Colorado to Memphis or to the East Coast to make beer. So it's CRX versus some other name here, which is a chemical. And most of the tank cars, I don't know, 80% of them are owned by Union Tank Car, or General American Tank Car, and they lease them to other companies. Most places don't own their own tank. They lease them. 
So you do that over here. And the covering this up, uh, one is having this information that tells me about the high pressure, low pressure thing. And then here it tells me about the uh, safety relief setting uh, for when it's supposed to open. Again, the 400 PSI here, that's the tank test pressure. That tells me when it's going to fade. Five car here, 1203, that's usually the gas leak. There's a couple hundred chemical name to products that have to be stuck to it. All right, another version, uh, DOT 113. These are cryogenic cars. Obviously, they look a little different than the other kinds of tank cars we looked at. Very cold products. They're meant to vent as they go down the track. So other kinds of containers. Intermodal containers. Uh, this is a compressed gas one, just like our DOT 112 tank car or 105 tank car, compressed gases. This is the cryogenic version, spec seven, just like we have cryogenic tank cars. Here's our box, which is like a truck. And then here's my uh, regular tanks for liquids. It's 101 and 102 based on boiling uh, points in this. So different versions of those. But here's the four, once in a like that picture, all four of them on one car. Famous photo I shot in So again, we, we need to understand about containers because that tells us something about what might be in the product or what products might be in the container and how we're going to deal with it. So, now, I don't know if you know this about uh, hazmat, but operations level people who are defensively trained can perform technician level skills if you have these kinds of products. As long as they have documented training. So a technician keep them in the package, in the container, defensive, just keeps them in the area. So there are rules out there that says, hey, I can train you to, to do offensive stuff at the technician level involved with these four chemicals. Why these four chemicals? We run into these all the time. Every time we go out the door at a fire station, we're going to run into gasoline or diesel fuel and vehicle accidents. So we can, we train with them, we practice them, we understand them. And what about natural gas and LP gas? Every building we go to is either going to have LP gas or natural gas for heating and stuff. So those are ones that we can do. But that's a rule. If you have that situation and you're working with that, then you, know, you got to be able to document the training. So, all right, so let's look at some chemicals. And yeah, this is really exciting stuff. So, all right, so just gasoline. Where do we find gasoline in your community? Everywhere. Yeah. How many of you work at a plant that fills your own trucks, you know, or other equipment, you know, and stuff like that? So, again, the air pressure is kind of a mixture of products, so we don't have a specific one because they may blend a variety of things together. They gasoline three to four times heavier in the air, you have specific gravity, boiling point, flashpoint minus 45. If I spill gasoline today on the road, am I going to have vapors? Yeah, it's about 40 degrees out. So, it's as long as you're as you come from minus 45 up, we're going to have vapors. So that's important to know when you go out the door of the fire station. What's the temperature outside? Or leave your office to go out to a spill in the parking lot or a spill in the plant. What's the plant temperature average? 75 degrees, 60 degrees. Would I have gasoline vapors? Yeah. So I got to make a decision. Flatable range 1.4 to 7.6, pretty narrow. Doesn't take much to cross into that. Ignition temperature 536. How hot is the exhaust pipe on your lawnmower, your motorcycle, your snowmobile, those kind of things, snowblower, when you're filling with gasoline and you spill it on the exhaust system? Probably above that. That's why it ignites and requires hydrocarbon type foam because, it, again, it, uh, we're looking for a blanket. So, again, we need to sort of know these basic things in general about making decisions. Okay, if I go to diesel fuel, again, it's a mixture of three to four times heavier in the air. The flash point 100 to 204, again, it gets into that combustible liquid range and the ignition temperature 350 to 625, depending on what other things are in it. And again, we're gonna use hydrocarbon foam on it. So we start to look at some of these things, become familiar. What does this tell me? I have four placards on the black, on the back. And in this case, they're all the same number. Four compartments versus one compartment. All right, what about natural gas? You went in 1971, and again, there's two different versions here, 71 and 72, based on how it's being used. So we, again, it's lighter than air. It's a gas, so it doesn't really deal with these things. It's a gas under the flashpoint. Flammable range 5 to 15. So if I have a flammable gas meter, and I'm sampling for uh, 
natural gas, my meters, when it gets to 100 on the meter, that means I've reached the 5% point. I don't know if we're in the range. I have to make an assumption. Yeah, there's a good chance we might be. If we reach five on the meter, which is equivalent to 100%, uh, where is it going to show this? It doesn't. You don't know that. You have to make some decisions. At 50% of the LEL, or I mean, do you, no, or LEL, lower LEL. Uh, at 50% of that, we evacuate or we make some decisions because we don't know when we cross the line at 100 how far into this thing we actually. So again, we're only going to measure 5% on the meter. Ignition temperature 1200 to 1400. And again, different numbers when you're looking at SDSs. So back there, we have a light switch. We have a natural gas leak in this room. How hot is the spark in that light switch? Click the switch. Now you remember back in chemistry class using sparkers to ignite Bunsen burners? They burn with the alpha or with that natural gas in the cluster of that. So the sparker to ignite that had to be in this neighborhood here. We'll say uh, 1200 degrees. So 1200 degrees. So could they switch back there, have a spark that out? Yeah. So he talked about going down to the basement. Oh, let's go down to the basement, turn on the light switch, go down the stairs, oh, ignite. How hot was the spark? The spark in those light switches are way in this area, which is why they look like natural gas or LP gas. So again, just think about some of these things as you're writing procedures. Using compressed gas or buses, kind of not. Look on the back of the bus. It has unique fuels. It has propane. So we deal with LP gas. We're talking about, again, a mixture of chemicals. Up north here, LP gas is pretty much all butane. Down south, it's pretty much all butane. Propane, I mean, butane down south because they don't need the heat output that we need up here. So again, it's mixed differently. We call it the same thing, but it has a different mixture of stuff. It's a gas, boiling point, flash point, minus 156 degrees, so it's always a gas in our life. 2.5 to 9.6 for our flammable range. Our ignition temperature is 878. So again, hot sources can ignite it as well as a spark. And normally it doesn't have any smell, so we have to add an odor. That's per capita. Which is added as an odor, just like in the natural gas, we add that capital as an odor. So, different kinds of transportation containers, different kind of uses. So, again, if I have an LP gas leak with a forklift truck, what do I need to know? Every in air gas, looking for ignition sources. How hot do the ignition sources need to be? Can a light switch do it? Yeah, you know, and, and uh, when I'm water, uh, hot work could be it. Variety of things. So again, where is it going? What's it looking for in the way of those things? Carbon dioxide, kind of an interesting one. There's a variety of things out there. Again, it sinks. It's not flammable. Extremely cold. The places are air or oxygen. And uh, so again, if you're unloading carbon dioxide at your plant, again, make sure you get gloves on. Remember that if we don't have air blowing around, you're going to have a non-oxygenated area by where all the valving is, stuff like that. Now, we've had firefighters and others, employees at restaurants, where we get a call, a medical call, hey, we got an employee down in the basement. What the heck? What's going on? Turns out, leaking carbon dioxide carbonation system. So having these outside is one of the advantages of that, is that you now have vapors in the building. But we've had firefighters get called, Phoenix, Arizona and stuff, who they got there, went down to the basement and do a medical treatment program, and were overcome by pubes from carbon dioxide, colorless, odorless gas in the basement. And uh, so again, we need to understand. So I showed you that McDonald's picture, and that's the problem is that they have carbon dioxide system in the building. And typically it's on the first floor, but if they had a basement, it could be down in the basement where the system is. Now you've got a place for all the papers to get. So again, there's the uh, McDonald's one. So again, you think to yourself, McDonald's, why do they have a chemical side? Oh, here's the port where they put the carbon dioxide into the internal system so they don't have to go inside of the tanks. All right, we have this pro product out here called ethanol, and we're doing a lot of stuff with ethanol. And there's really three kinds of ethanol that we deal with. One is UN 1170 right here, and that's the pure stuff that's used in the chemical world to make chemistry, chemical products and various things out there. And then we have 1987, which is ethanol, with three to 5% gasoline added to it at the plant, 
because they're going to mix it so that you can't drink it if it derails and it's spilling out and you get a big tank full of it to take home. It, it's going to be poisonous to you because of gasoline, three to five percent gasoline. And then we have 3475, which means gasoline with more than 10 percent ethanol. That's a California thing. And that's come back in across the country. So 3475 is that one. Gasoline with more than 10 percent. So if Biden says, hey, we're going to switch over to 80 percent ethanol, that would use that plant. 90%. So again, 1170s pure, 1987 is denatured, which means it has 3 to 5% gasoline in 3475 is gasoline with more than 10% ethanol. So again, we need to understand kind of what's going on with our ethanol and whether we're talking about pure or mixtures or combinations. And again, we need to look at alcohol foam because it's a polar solvent and admissible. It mixes with water. It wants water, so it's going to pull it out of the hydrocarbon foam, so we have to be suspicious. So here's 1987 out on the road. I showed you a 1987 tank car. Here's 1170, the pure stuff. It's drinking whiskey. Here's a 1987 C nature alcohol tank car. So Rich was asking here about the specification. So this car. Is one of the new ones because it's real much DOT 117. That's the specification and design. Then there's a J for jacketed. You know, this is a jacket over insulation. It has shelf couplers. It has head shields on each end for derailments. And then um, here's the 100 for the tank test pressure, 100 and a W for welder construction. And the safety relief device is set at 75 PSI. Things that we get out of it. And again, with the derailments that have occurred, when they used to put this in 111 tank cars, crashes, break open, all that stuff. So then they went to a DOT 111 CPC 1232 by adding half, half head shields on the end, improving the valve on the bottom, and looking and protecting the stuff up here on top. That still wasn't good enough. So now we went to DOT 117s, which is what this one is a new car. And then we have ones that we've taken from here. To here it retrofitted, that's what the R would mean if it's in here. And then we have, I have the new DOT 120, which is basically a pressure car hauling non pressurized products. So, again, we mentioned 3475. You may see this at local gas stations as you drive. Gasoline with more than 10% ethanol. All right, shot this at the Hotel the other day in California. Uh, this is swimming pool bleach or swimming pool hot tub chemicals, sodium hypochlorite, the UN 1791. And we say it's an oxidizer. What does that mean? You need to treat it like explosives. I will, because it can do all kinds of bad things. It's very reactive. It doesn't like to be around other things. What's it stored in? All kinds of containers. What's it stored by? So if you have a reaction that occurs, in other words, let's say it spills out of this container, you have oil-based products stored nearby, oil on the floor, you're going to have potentially have spontaneous combustion. I was at a college instructor. I used to do those Mr. Wizard demonstrations, you know, and we take chlorine HDH, we mix it with score hair cream. I know there's a lot of us who don't use score hair cream anymore, but uh, score hair cream, uh, Pine water disinfectant, brake fluid, all those things would ignite within a few minutes of this and produce a fire. So I used to take the uh, this chemical, put it in this side of an envelope, and then on the other side of the envelope, I squirt some hair cream in there. And then we go to do a demonstration at one of our consumers' power facilities. They would have picked up a cow shell place on the street for a fire safety demonstration in October. So just before I'm ready to start, wad it up so they mix it together, stick it down in the cushion of the couch. They'd introduce me, I'd start talking, and all of a sudden everybody's going, Hey, the couch is on fire behind you. Well, who's smoking on my couch? Who sat there and smoked on my couch? You know, and that also the big flame is coming out, couch is on fire, you know, Mr. Wizard kind of things. What was it really all about? A little understanding of chemistry, how things react to other things. So again, there's lots of stuff out there, but that was my common one. So swimming pool bleach, applying all disinfectant, and show it together. And just gave it a couple of minutes for it to heat up. And what was the fuel for it to burn? Paper and wool. So again, you'll see these kind of things occur in 
stores like fire and all the big box stores that'll get forklift to puncture through there. There's oil on the floor and they get a reaction or in somebody's home in their garage, they spill it. So be careful. Uh, sodium hydroxide. So uh, sodium hydroxide, you know, something big that's carried through town, you know, there's two, two kinds, 23 is solid, 24 is a solution. Uh, also known as caustic soda, lye, drain cleaner. How many of you had those at home, you know, kind of situation. And we just don't think about when we have it in a little container at home mix about the big trucks that are passing through town. And again, we're using it in a lot of different kinds of industries. So again, it's out there. But I do work at a grocery store as a cashier part time here in, down in the Allegan. So, you know, just looking at the sh stuff on the shelf, what's the active ingredient? Hydrochloric acid, sodium hypochlorite. Uh, and you'd be surprised at all these different cleaning compounds that we use for here. Sodium hypochlorite, that is also. So they're out there and stuff like that around us all the time. And it's not an uncommon event to get a call to a hotel where they have a person down in a guest room. Turns out it's a housekeeper. What was going on when they got there? People left, you're not cleaning out the bathtub. If a little bit of Drano doesn't work, then what do you do? Add more and maybe another chemical and they may react and suddenly they're vaping and gassing off. And the next thing you know, people are on the ground in the room. And that, you know, we were looking for Sally, couldn't find her to knock on her rooms. Pretty soon they find a room and Sally's on the floor. She's been gassed by what? A couple of cleaning compounds used together. Now, some of you could do that at home too. You know, I don't have enough Drano left over to clean out the hair and like drain. So I'll go to the grocery, I'll get something else. Did I ever look to see if these chemicals reacted? Well, no, we're at home. It's not a big deal, you know. And pretty soon, well, we have mom and the kids or dad and the kids or whatever who are in trouble. And these are just small containers of this big chemicals that I already showed you. So this is what I found. I've got to go back and look it up. Acidic toilet bowl cleaner. So what doesn't it like to be with? You know, yeah, we have all these other things that we got to be careful with, but what doesn't it like to be with that I might have in my home and, and maybe my I, myself or my wife would tend to mix with it because it's just the bottom of it left, you know, I'll get something else. Now we've got a medical emergency at work. It could be your cleaning staff at work, it could be at your home. Hotels, like I said, work on it. So here's potassium hydroxide, 1813, 1814, whether we're talking about it as solid or a liquid. Same thing as those little containers. Noise. Chlorine, do we have any chlorine in Grand Rapids area? Yeah, we clean the water with it, water go dirty, the water coming in to be clean. We clean dirty water to set it out. Again, it's a, a poison, strong oxidizer. Ideal H is 10 parts per million, so again, we need to be protected. It will support combustion, even though it's not marked that way. But it is a poison, and it's, so it, it does things to your body where you have moisture on your arms and your groin. If you're not protected. So here's chlorine in smaller containers. These are one ton containers. And then here's a chlorine truck. You don't see those very often. There's 50 to 60 of those in North America. And uh, I've seen a couple of them in New Mexico. This is one I was eating ice cream in Stillwater, Oklahoma. I had an ice cream sauce at Brahms. And I went, wait, I'm sorry, on the phone. Hey, just a second, I got to go talk to you later. Left the ice cream, follow the truck down the street, go get pictures. Because you just don't see chlorine trucks very often. They have the same fitting up on top as a railroad car, same uh, C kit up here to plug and patch and things like that. But these are commonly running through communities to go into water treatment plants or chemical plants, things like that. That is more unusual. Sulfuric acid. How many places do we use sulfuric acid? Sulfuric acid is the most used chemical in the world. So you can depend. You can tell about your industrial capabilities and your products here are outgoing based on how much sulfuric acid your company, your country produces or uses. So again, it is an acid, melting point, 50. Again, it doesn't take a lot to get vapors. It's the number one produced chemical in the world. It comes in all different kinds of containers for use. So how do we protect our employees? How do we train our employees? So yes. That, that, that's news to me. Try to say for a lot of people, what, what's the most common uses? Why do, uh, we make, why do we have that much of it? It's used in, in the farm in the chemical industry to make everything. So if you look up, if you type in your phone, 
What is sulfuric acid used for? Just list all these things from the medicines to chemicals, lots and lots of products. It's huge. But it's the number one thing. So they measure the, uh, the industry output across the world by how much sulfuric acid do they make, how much sulfuric acid they use, things like that. Rich, one of the areas where sulfuric acid, that people don't necessarily realize it, but um, if you have like the UPS battery backup system mm -hmm. uh, and you're doing your tier one, you may have enough batteries that you have to. It's a reportable quantity. It's a reportable quantity. And as a human being person outside of work, where would be the most common place you'd encounter sulfuric acid? How many of you jump car batteries and have an accident jumping car batteries? We're dealing with uh, so again, it, it's around stuff like that. So, so Rich, who collects all this data? <laughs> You're to be able to figure out so. the chemical industry is all the world. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, that, does that have anything to do with the United Nations being involved with it? That probably. Price? It's like CAS numbers, chemical abstract services. This is a company to look up, I must say it's in Ohio, and they track every chemical that's ever been made. They assign it a CAS number. So if you invented something at your home with your kids, you go, this might be have potential. I may never have to work here because it's made XYZ. You need to report it to the CAS group so they can assign a chemical abstract survey number to it. It's like, who keeps track of all these? Besides their numbers to it. So, like, let's say if Russia is making some of these chemicals, they're, they're not going to use a CAS system. They're going to have their own, right? Possibly. And, and so you'd almost have to have a reference well, matrix to be able to figure out. You may find that the Russian leadership isn't going to, but the Russian industry participates across the world with the oh. chemistry world and stuff, you know, at a lower level. So, but yeah, you can have to look at that. It's just one of the... There's a lot of it out there. It's transported in trucks and rail cars, and it's used in a lot of industries. But if you typed into Google, what does sulfuric acid get used for? What do we? Why do we make sulfuric acid? There's a whole list of general kinds of things. All right, hydrochloric acid, also known as muriatic acid, again lower pH, uh, neutralized with a base. The colorless liquid again, a lot of it out there. Uh, how many times have you gone into a hardware store to buy hydrochloric acid to use in some sort of home project? Need something, things like that. I think about the, the home fires we've had where they, in one case, we killed a firefighter in Jackson County in my department, Scott Thornton, because they were using mineral oil or linseed oil rags to repair, refurbish the cap. The, Cottage that they burned down the year before, they were redoing all the inside, and the rags were left in a bag, you know, to be stored up tomorrow, and they caught on fire because of a chemical reaction. Just linseed oil rags. Home remodeling. So, yeah, learn about these. This is one of the more interesting ones. Here we have anhydrous ammonia, UN1005. It's lighter than air, which seems hard to believe when you first see it coming out, it drops to the ground because it's heavy because of the moisture in it. Rises pH of 14, so it's on that base end versus the acid end of zero. One point minus 28 degrees to boil, it's a gas. It has a flammable range of around 15 to 28. Talk about that. Has an ignition temperature of about 1200 and pH 11 to 13, so it's on that end. Water moisture seeking, ideal H is 300 ppm as far as the hazard. So when we ship it in the United States, we ship it with a green placard. What does a green placard mean? Non-flammable gas. Wait a second, let's back up a second. What did I tell you right here? It has a flammable range, has an ignition temperature. It's one of the original fuel considerations for automobiles was anhydrous ammonia by Henry Ford and the others using their engines because it will burn, it will explode, all those kind of things. It just doesn't do it very easily. But the reason that we placard it with a green placard in the U.S. is that the definition that the Department of Transportation has for flammable gas is just slightly off from what these numbers are. So because it doesn't meet their definition, they call it non-flammable gas. Wait a second. 
the forensics exploit to kill a firefighter in Shreveport, Louisiana, a number of years ago in a, in a uh, refrigeration warehouse. Injured another guy, met the other guy at a program. Burn injuries all over his body from where the plastic soup melted. Flammable uh, flames came through. But outside of the U.S., every other country in the world considers anhydrous ammonia as a poisonous inhalation hazard, corrosive gas, except for the U.S. So I'm teaching in Saudi Arabia, it's a poison inhalation and a gas. In America, it's a non-flammable gas. We just kind of ignore that, which is weird. Up in Canada, if they ship anhydrous ammonia from Canada to the U.S., which they do all the time, I see tank cars come through, they come down from Port here on Lansing, Battle Creek, Edwardsburg, and then off the top. It'll have white placards on. What, wait a second, Rich, you said our placards are green. Well, when it comes from Canada, it has the poison liquid placards on it, and it will stay on throughout their trip to the United States, and then when it goes back. If we ship anhydrous ammonia to Canada for their use, it goes to the green placard to the border, then all those placards have to be removed, and the white ones put on. I'm an thing. And that's because everybody else besides us, outside of us in the U.S., consider a poisonous inhalation hazard gas with a corrosive problem. In our country, it is considered a non-flammable gas because the numbers in this area here do not match up with the definition of a flammable gas by the DOT. So because they don't match up perfectly with it, just disregard it. You go on the Internet, find videos of anhydrous ammonia burning. And typically, it burns inside a storage unit. Uh, I probably should have put a picture of it, but uh, a lot of the places that use anhydrous ammonia for refrigeration will have a placard, not a placard, a warning, 704 warning sign with a one in the red area for flammability. But those that are serious will have a three at the top diamond. And I can send you pictures of a three on the 704 because they truly believe that if we have an ignition source, a leak in our refrigeration room. It could ignite. There was a spark or so called. So there's a difference of a one or a three different places. And I just spark them. Just did Lansing, I showed different places in where they consider it not to be a real fire hazard because of information. Other places do consider it to be a real fire hazard potential. So the three versus the one. Well, Rich, I'm just kind of guessing maybe it's green in the States. Probably because uh, the lobbying groups, you know, far, uh, if far you got a green lobby. label like that, your insurance premiums will probably be a little less than a white well, label. Also, think about the community. The little guy that drives on the ag facility, fills up the tank, he's pulling back his tractor, his pickup truck, you know, going back to the farm. And if I put a flammable poison gas, all these things, placards on the tank, what would the neighborhood think? Uh, they're going to get excited. Yeah. If we just agree non flammable gas, not that big a deal. But uh, it is a problem. And the emergency response community in America, North, has for years has said we need to change this and put something else on it that's more reflect reflective of what the hazard really is. But the, the industry lobby groups have not been done. And you'll actually find that the many cases on the SDS sheets that the last tests for flammability were years ago. Every now and then you'll find one that has the right dimensions on that number there to UEL and LEL that will match up what DOT defines as final. I don't want to go do a test that makes me do more things. So, but lobbying is a critical deal. So, so again, here it is coming out. So you see it as a, a white cloud and an inhalation hazard. And again, because of the moisture content in the air and that the product, it stays looking like a cloud until that moisture dries out. These are classes that I was involved with teaching up in North Dakota. So we use a fan to blow it. We use what's called tarp recover, where you cover it with a tarp, like a blue roof tarp, if you lose your roof, or a firefighter salvage cover, and you put that over the top of the leak here. And then what happens is uh, it causes auto refrigeration and you go from the same moss coming out, but now it's auto refrigerated and you just now have some whiffing of vapors. Wow. So it's one of our techniques for getting control. And if you can't get to the king valve, which is the big valve, that maintains the whole refrigeration system. These are some techniques. So, and when I was in Iowa and uh, teaching the anhydrous ammonia response 
center of the country. Iowa is the number one state for anti-discrimination. Uh, the insurance company was telling the farm co-ops, we will not insure you anymore until you start training your people, the firefighters, and the farmers of your community how to safely use it. I just want to get tired of the lawsuits when the tractor driver tips over and gets burned or some other problem, and we get sued ultimately up through the, the egg facility. And so they, you know, they saw it as a real problem. That's the training, education, safety, things like that was an issue with the uh, for the people. And they, the insurance industry saw it starting here at the farm where the guy's using it, the company that's selling it, the emergency responders in the community are going to respond and what the knowledge level was. So up in North Dakota, we had a, a farmer who donated a 500 gallon tank to one of our classes. We had about 100 people there. And we didn't know we had inspectors from the state of North Dakota there. And up there, the farms are so big and so far apart that the truck actually delivers to the farm and not to the ag, necessarily to the ag facility. So they would come out and fill this, this guy's trucks, tanks up out there. So he donated the tank to the brought it in, you know, for us to use. And the state inspector found a half a dozen violations that would never have been found because they don't go to the farm necessarily because the farm tank never comes to town. And he got written up there. Yeah, so here is a nice guy for us, but had some problems on his trailer. All right, so nitrogen is another common one. How many of you use nitrogen in any of your facilities? Yeah, non-flammable gas. Uh, it's uh, basically, it's lighter than air, moves oxygen. And I, I did uh, some work for a company up in the Lansing area, and uh, they had a big nitrogen system in one part of the plant, in a lower basement hallway. I said, how do you know if you have a nitrogen leak? And I said, because you're going to have people walking down in there. There's a, a clear cloud and they're dropping on the floor. That could, that's not a good alarm. Hey, there's five people on the floor down there in the basement. So you need to have alarms to, to deal with that. But again, around people working around it, unloading valves, all that kind of stuff. And yes, it's cold, but also it's an oxygen free area. So nitrogen comes in a lot of different containers, usually a lot of places. Liquid hydrogen is one that's also a Used quite often, but again, the big thing with this is it's the expansion ratio of one gallon to 848 gallons of vapor. Usually, so if this truck opens up, I mean, it's going to be a huge gas cloud, and when it ignites, it's going to be a big fireball. Again, when we look at it, flammable range four to 75, there's almost no point where you, it's not flammable. Kind of like a settling two to 100 as far as that range. So, ignition temperature about a thousand. Helium, see a variety of containers of helium out there. Again, it removes oxygen. It's non flammable. Again, industrial is cold. That can be a problem. Uh, calcium carbide, this is an interesting one I've dealt with uh, working in my industry. These are containers of solid calcium carbide. Calcium carbide, when it's wet, makes a settling gas. So we go back to the old days of the miners, the lanterns. You used to put calcium carbide in there with water, make gas, they'll ignite it, now they have a lantern. So uh, again, that's still how we make a settling. This had a, this place here in Oklahoma had a big pit out back where they dump dry calcium carbide and then put water on it, collect it to gas, make a settling gas. So as an emergency responder, when these fall off a truck or a railroad car, my first question is a powder, get a tarp down to cover it so it doesn't blow away is asking what's the weather going to be? How long before it's going to rain? Because my problem from a dry solid to what? A lighter than air flammable gas. Hmm, that changes the story and the reactions a little bit. Suddenly, again, commonly found a product, patient temperature of 572, 2.5 to 100% in the flammable range is almost literally no place where it's not flammable explosive. I don't know whether you can find it. Again, it is lighter than air. Carbon monoxide, I just dealt with this at my house. We just had a new furnace put in because the heat exchanger cracked in our furnace, which means it produces carbon monoxide. Unfortunately, we didn't have a problem. We got it done before. But you take a building with some sort of furnace in it or hot water heater, you have engines running and all the power's off. So bring a generator over to the building, let's turn it on and it's running. But carbon monoxide is kind of an interesting animal. It's lighter than air. It is flammable, 
that's why I'm a range here and all that kind of stuff. That's why we have these carbon monoxide detectors you can get from a lot of places. But the thing is understanding where we're the bottom. As emergency responders, and I'm constantly teaching my fellow firefighters, when you get a call for a carbon monoxide alarm, when they call 911 and report it, if the 911 people tell them, gather everybody up, leave the building, leave the doors and windows open. So when we respond and get there in five or 10 minutes, what's the conditions like in the building now? Not anything like it was when their alarms were going off or they were having trouble breathing or they were turning red. It's now been oxygenated by the outside air. So now to find out really what the problem is, we have to close it all back up to make it like it was when they first started having problems. So when we go into that building, are we going to wear our regular clothing? We're going to wear firefighter strength of clothing. We're going to wear firefighter strength of clothing, SCBA. What are we going to wear? Because this stuff is flammable, and all I need is an ignition source, a spark. Could be the switch on the light switch going down to the basement or something like that that ignites this gas pump. And why we haven't had more firefighters injured because they walk in and drop, or they walk in and there's an ignition and they're not properly protected. Good question. But I'm always asking firefighters when I'm teaching and going to station. So what do you wear when you go when you respond to a carbon dioxide detector problem? We'll just go check it out. Do we think about the other hazards? You know, first off, when you get there, it's not going to be like it was when the people were in there with the problem. Because they the 911 people totally open up. So you close it all up, then we'll follow it up again and get it to go back to what it was like. Oh well, yeah. And uh, do you think about these other hazards, potential need for uh, respiratory protection, need for firefighter protective clothing, you know, that kind of stuff. All things to think about. IDLH 1200, a lot. Uh, acetone, you probably have it in your facilities, used in a lot of different cleaning products and things like that, paint brushes, stuff like that. And this is over in Holland, uh, and some of you might know where that is. This used to be called American aerosols back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, my friend, Brad Kamal, who just retired as a judge in Holland, his dad owned the plant when we were in high school together. But what they did there is they put the, in aerosol cans of paint at the pressure. So why would they need three tank cars of acetone washing out paint lines, changing colors, all those kind of things? So uh, again, acetone, Fire flammable, minus four degrees flashpoint. Flammable range 2.6 to 12. Again, gasoline was 1.4 to 7.6. So again, what are we doing with acetone? And again, many common times it is used as a cleaning agent. They buy it at the paint store, they buy it at the hardware store to clean stuff up. Fingernail polish removal. In fact, I just did a little project on my kitchen table, glass kitchen table, and I heard about it. And I said, well, don't you have some female posture removal? But I'll get this off. So, but again, how is it used? Where is it used? Big bottles, little bottles, big bottles. So, you know, phosphoric acid, buried in tank cars, trucks, all stuff. Where do we find phosphoric acid? Drink it all the time. You got older people around you, they'll tell you about, oh, you know, we used to clean the uh, wheels of our bikes with with uh, Coca Cola or the uh, bumpers of our cars get the rust off because of the phosphoric acid. Not a lot, but there is enough to do harm. I can change pH paper color by dipping it in Pepsi and Coke and things like that because of the phosphoric acid. So you think down the road, uh, I just had heart surgery last all I was 18. They did four bypasses on me, 95% block. They got the veins on my legs. I took a 30 year warranty program. And uh, so, but do you think any of that stuff over the years is going to cause harm to them? Little by little by little. And when we look at a uh, little bit in a short time, little or a lot of it in a short time, a little bit over a long time, that's the harm risk itself. And here's possible acid. Ethyl alpha ketone, common use chemical at home, at work, and things like that. Flammable, some of the issues with it. So, again, how are we protecting? What's the hazards to it? Stuff. Uh, windshield washing, when it works for consumers, all of our service centers have big uh, containers of, of uh, windshield washer cooler or methanol. 
And uh, every now and then you'll read about a oil change place that goes up in fire because they are mixing their ethanol or their methanol in the water to use in the deal in front of the hot water heater pipeline or the furnace pipeline. So when it comes out of these containers before it's mixed out, it's very flammable. And uh, then once you get it with water, we lose that flammability to it. But again, a lot of you may have your own places that are doing making their own windshield washer fluid. So when they first take it out of the container, very flammable. She diluted down with water, and goes away now. Bishop Point. So. Here's a wonderful collection. What do you think? This is a meth lab. This is the kind of thing you find along the road or some people's house or something like that. And there's nothing in meth that is chemically good for your body. Everything is a poison. Why these people? You know, actually, some people say, well, it's a good thing because it's taking care of some of those that we really don't need in this world. That's a bad way to think. But, you know, it is a bad situation. So, all right, as we get to the end here, uh, here's one. How many people know about Coleman fluid? What's it also known as? White gas, naphtha, different products sold for camping equipment, you know, lamps and stoves, stuff like that. Um, it's kind of interesting in that here it does have a, a, a UA number 1268. Does this, if I took a thousand of these cans and put it in the back of the truck, do I have to placard the truck? Thousand one gallon containers. Because this is called consumer commodity packaging. If I take 10,000 gallons of this and put it in a tank car or a truck or whatever, I got a placard. But as long as it's in this, these packages, it's consumer commodities, doesn't have to be placard. You have to be on shipping papers, but not placard be compliant. So a thousand gallons in these containers get damaged and ripped open, same as a thousand gallons that come out of a truck or a tank car. Same product, different rules, consumer commodities. Little chemical containers, Walmart is one of the biggest hazmat container carriers in the world. But they don't have placards in most of their stuff because it's consumer commodities. It's small quantities. That's their how stuff. Very flammable. Flash point zero degrees. So what you're saying is when I'm on the highway and I'm passing, I always want to pass these fuel trucks. Let's say 1203. When I see a Walmart truck, I should be <laughs> having a higher sense of Same with UPS. UPS is one of the largest transporters of hazardous materials in the country without any placards because they're carrying consumer commodity in small quantities. So here's one I just passed the other day on the 94 or one of the highways here, UN 1295. This is a uh, interesting product from Dow Corning. So if you're uh, using one of your uh, information sources, up here. This comes out of Dow Corning in Midland. It has a blue placard. What's a blue placard mean? I don't see that very often. So 1295 is trichloroseline. What is trichloroseline? Used in the silicon industry, so like that. What's the blue placard to dangerous when wet? So uh, again, it produces uh, corrosive vapors when it gets wet, and uh, it's one of those things. I was at a factory once, and I went out back. I said, "Where are all your trees? There's no leaves on your trees. They all look dead." Well, when we get our trichloroseline in. We always rinse out the 55 gallon drums that comes in out and back. So we're making what? Hydrochloric acid vapors, which is eating up all the trees out in the backyard, the wind doors. So again, it's a, it's pretty nasty stuff. Dangerous and wet is its primary hazard, but it's also corrosive and things like that. So it comes in a variety of different kinds of containers. So one of the company, chemical companies, or I mean, one of the chemicals made by the Dow and uh, and things like that. So as we can learn today, you want to go ahead and get the lights back here again. Thank you. Uh, you know, I hope you said as you learned about this. I didn't know that. That was one of my goals to get you to think. 
in the go away with it. Hopefully, it'll be a little safer with and around chemicals. Hopefully, you will train others to be safer with chemicals. Again, all lucky to you guys as the safety or the consultant or smart people about this. I want you to learn a little bit about what I call common chemicals that are passing through your community, used in your home, used in your business industry. In my case, used at our grocery store when I occasionally work there. And again, to think a little bit more about the decision making process and your knowledge of chemicals. And when they call you on the phone and say, hey, come down to the back dock, we got a spill. So what? They give me a chemical name or they give you a trade name. Okay, well, I've been in air vapors, lighter than air vapors, is it flammable, is there emission sources, all those kind of things. What do you know versus what do you have to look up? I, I want to say we need to know more so we can begin making decisions versus, well, just a second, I got to look it up on my Look it up on my phone. What kind of decisions can I make? Now, if I go back to one of the things I taught you early in the beginning. How many chem chemicals rise in the world? Of the millions of chemicals we have, how many rise? 12 or 13. 12 or 13. There's something you probably didn't know, so they, you go back to high school, Hama, Mimi, you know, those chemical names and stuff. It's a piece of history for you. But again, what do we know? What can we make decisions about? What can you tell the people, the employees that you work with about their safety involved with these chemicals? Because you know what? I'll take any questions, any uh, comments, any thoughts? There's business cards up here on the table if you want one. Sure, what can I have that? Otherwise, I thank you for listening and inviting me to your program today. So. Well, thank you, Rich. Uh, I think uh, maybe objectives uh, were met. I would say uh, everybody learned something. I'll admit I learned a lot at the end. Some of the stuff was uh, something that I knew before, but kind of put it on the back burner and I thought, wow, yeah, I kind of violated that rule too, didn't I? You know, I should have known better. And see, that's just the thing about some of these chemicals is uh, something bad might not happen. And then that's just reinforcing behavior or keep doing the bad thing until it finally catches up with you or somebody else, I'd say. So thank you, Rich, for uh, giving us a presentation. No problem. Also valued. Yes. Good point. And I have grandkids as well. And we, we a lot of times we play games on the highway about how many yellow cars you see or how many out of state tags there are. You have a new one now, which I like the diamond. Uh, you go and you're passing a truck and you see a diamond. What is the easiest? way to look at a diamond and read it at the at a grandkid level say we should really get around this thing pretty quick. It is so simple now ask them to use their smartphone and look up that placard just take yeah, a because they all carry smartphones yeah so have them look up the placard number and you can get this and then install this on their phone so or you just type in un 1693 and it'll come up with the chemical name yeah, yeah. or you can go to the erg as downloaded on your phone Look it up, but they all have they're all carrying smartphones. So all they do is tend to and all those things, you know, phones. Uh, so that's the easiest way. And then you can ask them, you know, well, what kind of chemical is this? And they can, if they're older, you can ask them, is this a flammable chemical? Does it have, and if they're a little further along, can you tell me something about the vapor pressure or the vapor density? Does it rise? Does it sink? Is it soluble? Does it mix with water? Does it not? And can you find a flashpoint for me? Even though flashpoint is important, fire point is where the fire actually keeps burning. Flashpoint means it's just going to ignite and burn off the vapors, and then I got to ignite it again. We don't separate those two, but they're actually two different things. And but what's the flammable range? So they can, I came back and tell you that it's five to 23. Okay, well, what does that mean? And of the five to 23, which one are you going to read on your, this is for you, which one are you going to be able to read on your meter, flammable gas meter, between zero and five? Because that's the 100% mark on the meters, the, the LEF. So you have no idea when it's exposed where it is above it. So I did, uh, if you do the math, the correction number, you may be able to correct over five. Math. The meter only gives you up with one LEL of the calibrate gas, which is probably not what you're sampling. You're going to have to go back and figure out what you're actually measuring and correct it. So like that. A lot of times when I worked for the State Police Hazmat Center or teaching for other industries, I was give them, okay, you have a truck in a parking lot along the road highway, and there's a clear colorless liquid pouring out of the back of the truck on the parking lot. Baths, rest stop. What is it? 
the placards in the truck. Is that one of the things that the placards tell me, or is this a smaller quantity that didn't get a placard? It's clear colors. So should I take a match and throw it in, see if it does anything? <laughs> should I do vapors with a final gas meter? See, oh, did I first do pH vapor to find out if I'm going to trash my gas meter? Because it's gross, you know, or dip it in pH vapor. So there's a whole process. You can, and again, and those of you who know about me, you know that we always start pH paper because, again, we need to know we aren't going to trash it. And then which do you look at on those four dials? There's oxygen, flammable, and then maybe two uh, chemicals. Which ones of those do I look at first? Well, you look at oxygen because if I have bad oxygen, uh, 50,000 parts per million will drop 1% oxygen. So I go back and forth. That also, if I don't have between 19.5 and 23.5, I won't get a good reading on my flammable gas meter. It's got to be in that point. So I got to look at oxygen first, then I can go to flammable, and then I know 50,000 parts per million will drop oxygen at one percentage point. So I can go back between those other gases. And that's all part of just basic understanding of meters. When you start in the meter reading, you start here, you start here, you start down there, and it goes back to understanding vapor density. To me, common basic stuff, but that's what I've lived and done for 50 years. So my goal in life at this point in time is to make people smile and laugh, and one. But two, teach them what I have learned and be able to use it in other opportunities. So, so. All right. Yeah, the only thing I want to add is uh, I used to carry one of these in my vehicle. When, when the night, you know, you said when they're grandkids, you got to start them when they're young. Because I started when they were like 14, 15, 16 years old in the car. After the third identification, all right, Dad, put it away. Yeah. <laughs> you know, give it a break, get it a rest. And the last trip I took out to Utah last year at this time, uh, they didn't, my son didn't even want to hear it. He says, Dad, I got a smart wall. I can figure it out. You're on vacation, just <laughs> give it a break. <laughs> and also, I do. So, yeah, start them when they're grandkids so they get used to it. You can get that eight bucks on Amazon, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is called the pocket version, you know. So I don't have any clothes that have a pocket that big. Like <laughs> well, an eyelash pocket guy doesn't fit any no, it's it. But yeah, it's all on the phone now. And that's great stuff. Any other questions? Hopefully I gave you some stuff to think about today and then when you go back to work or as you travel and start to think about some of these things. Or when you look around your chemicals at home, you ask the question, why do I store them in the cupboard in the garage or why do I store them under the sink? When at work, these would have to be where? Something like that. Did any of you see, just to finish up, did any of you see the uh, story about the Walmart facility fire down in Indianapolis? I'm still trying to figure out what the cause of that was. But the question is, why did they turn off the sprinklers systems to the building and burn it down? Because the community told them they were using way too much water. And I was just in California, and uh, my friend Emil Bourdais, who I met in New Mexico, and I had lunch last Wednesday when I flew in in Redwood City, and he wanted to talk about the San Jose. A Home Depot fire that just burned down. They just arrested a homeless guy who was stealing stuff and he set the fire to divert other people. But they're still saying sprinklers may not have worked or didn't work well enough or the fire alarm didn't go off. And then I go back in the 80s, we had the Kmart fire in Pennsylvania. Some of you may or may not remember the old Kmart fire. That was where the aerosol containers, WD 40, guy on forklift trucks dropped the thing, vapors come out, ignited by the forklift truck, containers catch on fire. And so I have a sliding firewall doors. They had a sprinkler system spray water down. It's concept of a deluge system, you know, which is fine to stop the fire, but the containers were rocketing through the water, setting fire on the other side. Pretty soon the fire was bigger than the sprinkler demand and the sprinkler sizing for the building and for the building down. So I'm waiting to see all the reports on how much of this goes back to some of the same concepts of water. Dave has been around as long as I have, and he will remember and tell you that when they, after the Kmart matter happened, we all had to put all our five layer saws in metal containers, chicken wire, uh, safety canteen cages, all these things because of that fire and it changed the whole insurance world related to aerosol containers. So we'll see what happens with these little fires. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, coming up, May 24th, we've had, we have a tour tentatively scheduled. Uh, we might change the tour to something else. We have a tour twice a year, once in the fall and then once Thank in the you. springtime. So we'll get you more information on that. And then the last event for the year after that would be the uh, annual golf scholarship deal. And so mark on your calendars, June 23rd, that will happen. 
and uh, we'll get you more information as to all the particulars in the next uh, couple of weeks or so. But just make sure that you get that on your calendar. So uh, it'll be again at the uh, Meadowbrooks. That's been a real good deal for us for the last uh, three years or so. And so that's all I have at this point. And uh, we're welcome to network. If you got to go back to work or go back and do a remote play bookie, I, I guess that's your prerogative. I take a look at the chemicals at your facility. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no